Love's YouTube channel. My name is Donnie. And I'm Brianna. We are so excited that you found our channel. And we pray that today's message is life-changing. But before we get to the message, we invite you to subscribe to our channel and follow us on all of our social media platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you are ever in Orlando, you are welcome to stop by and see us. We would love to meet you. With that being said, let's go ahead and watch the message. That's Luke chapter 18, and we're looking at verses 18 to 30. A ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. I have kept all these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, you still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Seeing that he had become sad, Jesus said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, then who can be saved? He replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Then Peter said, we, look, we have left what we had and followed you. So he said to them, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left a house, wife, or brothers or sisters, parents or children because of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more at this time and eternal life in the age to come. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray for his guidance. Holy Spirit, we praise your name this morning. We praise you for the love that you've lavished upon us that we may be called your sons and daughters. We praise you that you are unchanging and unfailing, Lord. We ask now for your spirit to be upon us during this time that your word would be proclaimed faithfully, and that you would awaken our ears and open our hearts to all you have to teach us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, please be seated. Brothers and sisters, there's a reality show on television known as Undercover Boss. It's a show where someone from upper management and a company will put on a prosthetic disguise and perform an entry-level job. So the people explaining the job to them don't know who they are. And of course, the low-level people training the undercover boss are usually amazing, cool people with compelling backstories because that's what makes good TV, right? And then at the end of the episode, the true identity of the boss is revealed. And they give out rewards like promotions or bonuses or scholarships to deserving employees. Sometimes they make changes to the way things work at the company as a result of their experience. But occasionally on the show, someone will almost recognize the boss. They will kind of look and do a double take. Who is this guy? People tell me he's the new dishwasher from Kansas, but something seems off. They almost recognize who they're dealing with, but not quite. And that makes me wonder, what if it was not the CEO of a company, but the creator of the universe who came and took a lowly position among us, his created creatures? Would we recognize him? Would we figure out who he was? And of course, this isn't hypothetical. This is the story of Christ, the word who became flesh and dwelled among us. And when he walked here on earth, some people recognized who he was, but some didn't. Some people met the creator of the universe face to face and had no idea who they were talking to. And in today's passage, we have a man identified as a ruler. He's often referred to as the rich young ruler because we learn later in the passage that he's rich. And Matthew's account of this story tells us he was young. And this rich young ruler is asking a very astute question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he's come to the right place for answers, hasn't he? Jesus is the exact right person to ask. 
And we get the impression that he almost understands who Jesus is. He almost gets that Jesus is more than a teacher, but is God. And as we'll see from the passage today, if Jesus is God, that makes a huge difference. The truth that Christ is not just a man, but is the divine Son of God, has concrete implications for how we live. We're going to see today that it's necessary for us to acknowledge that Jesus is God. And because he's God, there's two implications we see in this passage. First, we must submit to him. And second, we need to trust him. So let's start with the initial interaction in verse 18. Notice that the ruler addresses Christ as good teacher. Now this phrase, good teacher, appears nowhere else in the New Testament except for Mark 10, which is Mark's account of this same story. Good teacher is actually an unusual form of address. The Old Testament says again and again that God is good. That was accepted. But in Jewish writings of that day, Teachers were almost never referred to as good. There was something unusual here, and Jesus calls him out on this in verse 19. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, at first glance, it may seem like Jesus is saying something strange here. It sounds like Jesus is differentiating himself from God. It sounds like he could be denying that he's God, but actually, it's the opposite. This rich young ruler calls him good teacher. This is no ordinary form of address because perhaps he senses that Jesus is no ordinary rabbi. But he doesn't quite get who Jesus truly is, and Jesus is nudging him in that direction. If Jesus is good, and only God is good, then who is Jesus? And Jesus' he, words here invite us to consider the same question. Who is Jesus? Because this is a question that many, many people, like the rich young ruler, get wrong. This guy's error is one that people still make today, and they make it all the time. The error that Jesus is a good teacher, but that's all he is. Jesus is a good teacher, but he's not the word made flesh. Maybe some would say he had a special relationship with God. Maybe he was sent by God to teach us important things. But ultimately, all he was was a man, many people believe. A good teacher who died a tragic death. Somehow rumors spread that he was resurrected. Centuries later, people started worshiping him as God. But really, they argue, he was just a man. Brothers and sisters, we know this isn't true. Scripture tells us clearly that Christ was fully human, he experienced everything we experience, but that he was also fully God, the second member of the Trinity who existed long before he was born of Mary, who created the world. Jesus himself made this clear. Scripture also tells us that his death is not simply a random tragedy called by jealous, caused by jealous political opponents. It was so much more than that. It was the means which God designed for the human race to be reconciled to their creator. Christ really died, he really rose again, and the disciples didn't get it at the beginning, but they eventually did get that he was God. The early church recognized him as God, not just admiring his teachings, but worshiping him from the very founding of the church. And this is important. If you're talking about Jesus with someone and they say, yeah, Jesus was a really good teacher, we need to be thinking, yes, he was, but he was so much more. Imagine there was a woman trapped inside a burning building. Imagine she's in an inner room. There's a fire outside her door and she thinks, yeah, this is it. I'm going to die today in this fire. And suddenly, a fireman bursts through the door. Ma'am, I'm here to rescue you. What is her response to that? Can you imagine her thinking, wow, this fireman's really handsome. <laughs> he's got helmet head, and he's covered with soot, but I bet he cleans up pretty good. Hey, Mr. Fireman, do you work out? Can you stand here a minute so I can take a selfie with you? Because I'm going to send this to my friend. That kind of response would be ridiculous. He would have to say, say to her, Ma'am, I didn't come here so you would admire me. I came here to save you. 
I'm here to rescue you from certain death. You need to take my hand and follow me now because you thinking I'm handsome is not going to deliver you from the terrible situation you are in. As unlikely as this situation sounds, this is the actual condition of anyone who says, yeah, Jesus was a good teacher, but just a good teacher. He came to teach us, but not to save us. He was an amazing man, but he wasn't God. He's someone we should learn from, someone we should admire, but not someone we would give our lives to. Brothers and sisters, this is not us. This church, the outpouring of Orlando, stands as part of the Christian church from around the world, a line going back many centuries to the disciples themselves who confessed that Christ is more than a man. Christ is God. And because of that, Christ is worthy not only of our admiration, but is worthy of our worship. Christ is the divine son of God, brothers and sisters, and each of us must recognize, like doubting Thomas after he stopped doubting, that he is my Lord and my God. The rich young ruler didn't get it. He recognized a good teacher, but he didn't recognize the creator of the universe. Because if he had, if he had realized that Christ is God, then there are implications. If he is God, we must recognize him as God, but we must also submit to him and trust him as our Lord. And submitting can be so tough. Look at this ruler in our passage. Christ answers his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In verse 20, by listing for him the commandments. And the man affirms that, yes, I have done these things. Now, we know that no one is perfect. 1 John 1, 8 tells us, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But let's just give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he has kept all the commandments perfectly. What's the problem then? Well, Jesus knew the real issue in this man's heart. Jesus could see that he had a lot of possessions, and he loved his possessions. In fact, did you notice when Jesus listed the commandments in verse 20, they seemed to follow the Ten Commandments roughly. Take a look in your Bible, if you have it open, at verse 20. Adultery, seventh commandment. Murder, sixth commandment. Stealing, eighth commandment. False evidence, ninth commandment. Honor your parents, fifth commandment. He's listed five of the Ten Commandments here. Now, we're starting a sermon series in two weeks on the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk more about them. But the Ten Commandments are generally divided into two tables. Table one is the first four commandments, and those are about our relationship with God. Table two is the last six commandments, and they focus on our relationships with others on this earth. So Jesus lists five of the Ten Commandments, but what he leaves out is no accident. What does he leave out? Well, in the second table, he listed five of the six commandments, he left out the 10th commandment, do not covet. Why? Why did he leave that one out? Now, covet is not a word we use much in English outside of the 10 commandments. And we'll learn a lot more about it in the upcoming sermon series, but coveting is basically a deep yearning to have something. It's a burning desire for some material object. Jesus doesn't list that command because he knows that this man covets. This man loves material things deeply, but instead of throwing it in his face, hey man, what about the 10th commandment? Christ instead makes a request in verse 22 that should lead the man to see the problem. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor. Just like the question Jesus asks him in verse 19, this should make the man stop and think. He should be asking, am I really keeping the law? But not only did David did Jesus leave out the 10th commandment? He also left out the entire first table, which defines how we should relate to God. And the very first commandment is so clear. You shall have no other gods before me. God must come first. You can't have a burning desire for things of this world and still put God first. You cannot serve two masters. This ruler didn't acknowledge Jesus as God because if he had, it would have required submission. Submission would have required him to be more committed to Christ than he was to his possessions. And that was something he could not do. When you see Christ as a good teacher, but not as God, there are limits to your commitment. It was a limit the rich young ruler couldn't get past. 
He didn't want to submit if it meant giving up his wealth. Understanding that Christ is not just a man, but as God requires us to submit to him, to make him Lord of our lives. But there's another implication as well. We, we have to submit to him, but we also have to trust him. Jesus told him to sell all you have. So not just the beachfront vacation house in Vero Beach, not just the yacht you bought from a Russian oligarch, not just the extra condo in New York, sell everything, sell the roof over your head, sell your means of earning a living. If this man was gonna obey Jesus here, he'd have to submit, but also he'd have to trust. Where am I gonna live? What am I gonna eat? Jesus says, trust me. Look at 24 and 25. Jesus continues talking about wealth. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Wow, that's strong speech from Jesus. This is vivid imagery to describe something that we all would say, yeah, that's impossible. And the people listening understood that, didn't they? They respond with, then who can be saved? Being rich was a sign of God's favor, they believed. They knew what scripture said about Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, David. They had God's favor, and they were blessed with riches. So they're asking, if people who appear to enjoy God's favor can't be saved, what about the rest of us? If the rich have no chance, does anyone have a chance, actually? That's what the, the people listening here today are wondering. And Jesus' response tells us so much. What is impossible with man is possible with God. The rich man cannot get himself into heaven. No one can get themselves into heaven. You may be a man of means, but you don't have the means to get yourself into heaven. You may be able to use money to solve a lot of problems in this world, but it can't solve the problem of your own sinfulness. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. He can provide eternal life. He can solve the problem of your sin, but you have to trust him. You see, when you have money, it's so easy to trust in money. Money gives you security, doesn't it? We don't have to worry about tomorrow if our bank accounts are large enough. We don't have to worry about losing a job if we have enough on reserve, or about medical bills, or car repairs. Money soothes our anxieties doesn't it? And money's where we put our hope. I have a lot of problems, but if I could just get a little more money, my problems would go away. I would be problem free. I'm just waiting for that big payday. I'm just waiting for the day I hit the numbers or for the day when someone finally realizes how much I'm worth and compensates me accordingly. And when that day comes, it will be smooth sailing. It's so easy to put our trust in money. But money isn't the only thing we trust. Look at verse 28. Peter says, look, we have left what we had and followed you. But the disciples didn't have great fortunes to leave behind, most of them. They were fishermen. So what did they leave behind? Houses, wives, brothers, sisters, parents, children, according to verse 29. These are the things they left behind. Now, this seems a little weird. How can Jesus tell people to leave their parents if the fifth commandment, which he's just quoted, says, honor your parents? And is he saying husbands should leave their wives? Parents should abandon their children? And also, we've been talking about wealth. What's the connection between giving up wealth and these other things? Well, these items in verse 29 aren't just a list of random things. To give up a house is to give up security. You can lose all your money in the stock market or a business venture, but real estate never disappears. Land is always there. It's easy to find a sense of security in owning a home. And in the time and place where the disciples are living, there was very little in the way of social welfare. The government isn't gonna take care of you. Your parents are gonna take care of you. And when you get old, you don't count on social security to keep you housed and clothed and fed. You count on your kids. And when you need a loan, you're not going to FEMA or FHA or the Department of Education. You're going to your brother. <laughs> you can try to talk him into forgiving your student debts. 
Jesus isn't telling you to walk away from your responsibilities to these people, but he is telling you that these relationships are not your ultimate security. They are not the place where you put your trust. He wants your trust. And that trust comes with a promise in verse 30. He will give back what you give up. If Christ is indeed God, he can do anything. He can provide everything you need, but he asks that you trust him. This is hard for us because just like the rich man, we feel like we're giving up something we can see clearly, but we're getting back something that we can't see. So maybe we feel like there's no guarantee. But there is a guarantee, brothers and sisters. The guarantee is the promise of Christ that we read in the word of God. The guarantee is, the guarantee is there, but the question is, do we trust him? Do we trust Christ enough that the choices we make in our current reality reflect our confidence in the future hope he promises? Do you trust him rather than in money or houses or friends or family or connections or your job or your spouse? Where is your ultimate trust? You know, according to the nonprofit group International Samaritan, 15 million people around the world are part of garbage dump communities who pick through garbage dumps to survive, often living in them. They live on less than $2 a day with little or no access to health care or education. Their average life expectancy is 35 years. It's really impossible for us to comprehend. Imagine that was you. Imagine you are living that way, hungry, sickly, dressed in dirty rags, and one day, a rich man comes along and offers you a better life. He offers you a home with as much delicious food as you want. Clothing, closets full of it, medicine, the best health care in the world. Imagine he offers you everything you need. Can you see yourself turning him down? Can you imagine saying, no, what I have is good enough? You know, actually, I'm good at finding rubbish. I have more rubbish than my next door neighbor. He's jealous of me. The other, rub rub <clears throat> the other rubbish pickers admire me. Can you imagine turning down that offer with reasons like that? But Paul tells us in Philippians 3.8 that everything he once thought was gain, everything that once made him proud, all his achievements and accomplishments, Paul tells us that compared to knowing Jesus, these things are rubbish. They're dung. They're garbage. This rich young ruler is turning down eternal riches and saying, no, I'm happy here with my garbage. Money, houses, jobs, relationships, these are not bad things. But compared to Christ, they're worthless. If you covet things of this world, if you're clinging to them, you might as well be clinging to garbage. Does this mean you need to give away all your money? Should you sell everything you have and give it to the poor? Everybody's listening now. <laughs> there are Christians in history who have understood these verses that way. But this is not ultimately about having money. It's about loving money. So as we wind down, let me ask you to reflect on two things. Firstly, ask yourself, do I love money? And if you're poor, there's no free pass here because you don't have to have money to love money. So ask yourself, do I love money? And second, for those of you who said no to the first question, ask yourself this, what evidence is there in my life that I don't love money? How does my life look different than a person who does love money? Do I make career choices that are different from someone who does love money? Is my practice generosity different than someone who does love money? Is my family life different than someone who does love money? Am I tithing? Are my giving patterns different from someone who does love money? Your tithing and your generosity will not get you into heaven. We don't believe in works-based salvation in this church. But your actions do reflect your values. So if you're not living differently than a person who does love money, ask yourself, do you really not love money? Are you walking away from Christ sad 
like the rich young ruler because the promises of Christ mean less to you than the rubbish of this world. Christ is not just a good teacher, but is our Lord, who we submit to. We can't say, God, I commit everything to you, but I'm keeping my money. That's off limits. That's not submission. We can't say, God, you can have all of me except my sexuality. That's mine. God, you can have everything except this grudge I have against this person who wronged me. I don't want to give that up. You can have everything except alcohol. I need that comfort in my life. If you're clinging to anything, even if it's something that's not bad in itself, but if it's your true first love rather than Christ, give it up today. Offer it up to God in prayer. Confess that you're putting confess what you're putting before Christ. Confess your own brokenness and inability to change. Ask him to work in your heart to help you give it all up to him. Uh, let me conclude. I'm, I'm going to close in prayer. Hey, I pray that today's message was encouraging to you and I pray that it was enlightening for you. It's always amazing to hear about the generous character of God, that God gave us the gift of his one and only son so that we would have life. What do you do when you hear about the gift of God through his son? I tell you what you do. You respond. We respond to the gift of God. The heart of Christian generosity is responding to the generous character of God. And so, hey, we invite you to come alongside us and live on mission. We do so much in the city of Orlando to be a blessing to those in our community and to help those in need. If you want to participate with us, you can go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, and click on the Donate tab, or you can text to give at the number on the screen. We pray that we've been a blessing to you, and we hope to see you soon. Take care.